In the previous episode, we discussed what causes Lyme disease, how it can be contracted, what its symptoms are, and how diagnosis can present a problem in some cases. Probably all cases if you're a veterinarian. So what makes diagnostic testing so tricky? The purpose of tests is, or should be, to give you a hint whether BB is present in the body and actively causing problems. Direct testing detects the germ itself. There are several methods for this, but BB is notorious for its hiding skills, so obtaining proper samples from patients, then reliably examining them, is neither simple nor cheap, and in most cases not possible. So we gently take a sample with utmost care, glasses and jewelry should be removed first, we run the test and pray to Zeus for a useful result. Direct testing, therefore, is not a routine diagnostic method. The way to go is indirect testing, which doesn't detect the bacteria, but antibodies produced against it by the patient. If antibodies are present in the blood, the patient is infected, or was infected at some point in the past. BB may already be long gone, but even if it isn't, the current symptoms are not necessarily caused by it. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. To give you a comparison, let's say you're a bit under the weather, the doctor runs some tests and it turns out you've got no legs. But is that the reason you're sick now? Maybe you lost them years ago and it has nothing to do with your current problems. In dogs, you have to take a positive result with a huge grain of salt because in some areas of the world, 75% of healthy dogs may test positive due to past infections. Also, antibodies take some time to be produced in measurable quantities after initial infection, and before that happens, diagnostic tests come back negative even if the patient has Lyme disease. It may also happen that antibodies produced against other germs mimic the ones against BB, and the test mistakes one for the other, resulting in a false positive. It's like getting diagnosed with no legs, when in fact it's your arms that are missing. So, in short, you can't always trust a negative result, you really can't always trust a positive result, plus it costs money, so why would you spend your dime on an unreliable test when you could buy dozens of nose-mustache-eyebrow glasses for the same amount? Because it's possible to do it in a smart way. First of all, there are several different kinds of tests, even within the indirect testing category, with different strengths and different weaknesses. Second, we're not limited to one-time testing. In a lot of cases, patients are tested several times at specific time intervals with various tests because the changes in test results also provide information. And in the end... Um, dramatic music, please. <clears throat> and in the end, patient history clinical signs, antibody testing, and the response to therapy all fit together like a magical puzzle, forming the diagnosis. Or not. Sometimes you just don't know. But let's say you or your pet have been diagnosed with Lyme disease, and let's suppose it is the correct diagnosis, what's the proper treatment? BB, being an old-school bacterium, politely dies if the patient is given antibiotics. And you don't even need fancy-ass 24th generation epic facecycline, good old doxycycline or amoxicillin given for 2-4 weeks will do the trick, and anti-inflammatory drugs will help with the symptoms in the meantime. Now, killing BB will not reverse any permanent damage done to the body, but most of the time you can expect a full recovery. There are cases, though, mostly of arthritis, where symptoms persist even after the infection is cleared. This period may last months and may or may not need a repeat course of antibiotics, experts don't quite agree on this. And there's the infamous post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, god knows what it is, but it's not something that reacts to antibiotics and it can ruin your Sundays, well, indefinitely. Dogs recover pretty well in general, although cases of Lyme nephropathy don't end in blossoms and butterflies. Unless they are dead. 
An important thing to note is that overcoming Lyme disease will not give the host a long-lasting protective immunity in the future. You can contract and enjoy Borreliosis as many times as you like. The prevention of Lyme disease is most efficiently achieved by preventing tick bites. There's a separate video on specifically this topic with plenty of details, so just follow the card in the top right corner. To give you a brief summary, for humans, short-term protective measures work best, like protective clothing and repellents you smear on yourself. No tick will ever bite you on your hike if you're wearing a hazmat suit filled with tick repellent and cook yourself in it under the scorching sun. But maybe you want to find a healthy balance between that and running around naked in the bushes. For dogs, we use long-lasting protective measures in the forms of spot-ons, collars or pills to kill or scare away incoming ticks. But why all the fuss, you might ask? Let's just yank out the tick if it attaches. Surely it will not infect you straight away, right? First of all, good luck noticing ticks on Priscilla. A whole battalion of Roman phalangites could hide in her fur. And second, don't be so sure about your safe time. The bacteria reside in the infected tick's midgut and once the blood comes rushing in, they need about 24 to 48 hours to properly wake up, get a coffee, shave, shower, take a dump and then stroll down to the salivary glands from where they get injected into the host. Now, that sounds like a long enough time to remove the parasite, but the problem is, the tick that bit you, or your pet, may already have sucked blood from another host before, meaning BB could already be in its salivary glands all hyped up and ready to go. Oh, but you've been told ticks don't interrupt their feeding to switch hosts. Well, not if they don't have to, but guess what, life's not fair to ticks either. Say a uh, deer thinks too hard about the thermodynamics of black holes, gets a stroke and dies, any ticks attached to it will be forced to leave mid-blood meal and, if they haven't had enough yet, find a new host. Which could be your dog. Or you. And this just in. It turns out some Borrelia strains may be able to reach the salivary glands even before the tick takes a blood meal. So remember, there's no time short enough to guarantee you will not get infected. This is why products that repel ticks before they bite, as opposed to killing them after the fact, are theoretically somewhat better at preventing transmittable diseases. And if you one way or another notice a tick attached to you or to your dog, remove it as soon as possible. How? Check out my video on ticks to find out. Let us say you just removed a tick, but you're completely fine. There's no rash, no fever, no weakness. With no means of diagnosing infection this early, shouldn't you take a little antibiotics anyway, just in case you got infected? While there is an opinion that a one-time preventive dose might be helpful, other experts think it's better to just wait and see, because a short-term antibiotic shock might not eliminate all the bacteria, just weaken them temporarily, and possibly prevent EM from appearing, and nobody likes Borreliosis going stealthily into late stage like a ninja. We want to see EM because it means an early and almost certain diagnosis. A visible EM is the doctor's best friend, not counting stale coffee and chocolate boulder muffins. With dogs, we also tend to go with no preventive antibiotics, but for slightly different reasons, because dogs don't develop EM anyway. A. As said before, we're not sure if a one-time dose is truly effective. B. A tick on a dog is usually not a rare event and irregular, frequent, unwarranted use of antibiotics can contribute to the spread of drug resistance. And C. Dogs have a good chance of not getting sick anyway. And what about the tick you just plucked out? Should it be tested for the presence of BB? If you cannot contain your curiosity and you like annoying your doctor, sure, you could have it tested, but whatever the result, it's probably not going to influence medical decisions in any way. More on this in my tick video. What about vaccines? You can get a shot against tick encephalitis, so surely there's one against Lyme disease, right? Right. 
Several vaccine products from several manufacturers are available for dogs and just as many for humans, provided they are dogs. If you're a regular human-human, no vaccines against Borreliosis exist for you right now. Sorry. If you're the kind of person who has seven locks and a poisoned bear trap on their front door because, you know, you can never be too careful, you'll probably want to have your dog vaccinated. That said, the World Small Animal Veterinary Association labels Lyme vaccines non-core in their vaccination guidelines, meaning it's only recommended to give them to dogs with a known high risk of exposure. This translates into English as there's a load of infected ticks in the area. But even so, the primary method of prevention by a mile is, and should be, proper tick control. Summing it up, Lyme disease is a bacterial infection spread by ticks and it most notably affects people and dogs. Its symptoms appear whenever the hell they want, in whatever form they damn well please. Combine that with ambiguous test results and diagnosis becomes notoriously tricky. Except for that, that's simple. Antibiotics effectively treat the disease, most of the time, but you're better off preventing it altogether by protecting yourself and your dog against tick bites. There, yet another Lyme victim. So sad. The technical information in this video was fact-checked by Catherine Reif, expert in all things tick. I thank her very much, as much as I thank Siva for its support. If you've made it this far, why not like, comment or subscribe, or check out my other videos. I know it would make at least one of us happy.